When people think about owning a vineyard, what often comes to mind is romantic scenery with beautiful buildings, vineyards on rolling hills as far as the eye can see, and wines paired with delicious culinary delights. Well, there's plenty of that, but in reality, making high quality wine is a difficult business that combines both art and science. A lot can go wrong due to mother nature or human error. We wanted to learn more about the risks associated with winemaking. We also wanted to have a little bit of fun. So we invited David Duncan to join us. David is the proprietor, chairman, and CEO of the famed family-owned Silver Oak Winery in Napa Valley. It turns out that David's more than just a winemaker also. He's a Colorado boy who's been a cowboy, a skier, hunter, fisherman, and he's a member of the band Silverado Pickups, which has warmed up for our previous guest, Tim McGraw, several times at charity concerts. So we caught up with David at his winery in Oakville, California. So David Duncan from Silver Oak Winery, welcome to the Adrenaline Zone. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Sandy. I'm pleased to be here coming to you from uh, the middle of Napa Valley. And uh, Sandra, pleasure to uh, meet you and, and, and uh, be on your show. Thank you. Yeah, we're really delighted you're here and we can't wait to talk to you about the art, science and risk of winemaking. But before we get into that, let's start a little bit uh, with the history of how you got into it, where you grew up, what attracted you to winemaking in the first place? Yeah, so my uh, my father was a serial entrepreneur, and uh, I, I like to say that he he always invested in Mother Nature based businesses. So he actually started a ski area in Colorado in 1965. Um, we started Silver Oak, co-founded Silver Oak in uh, 1972, and Dad was also in the oil and gas business um, and got more serious about that in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and uh, so I always like to say we started Silver Oak before, <laughs> the, before the oil business helped out things a little bit. But, uh, um, you know, so we're a family business. And uh, my path here uh, actually led through my education. I got my master's at the University of Denver and uh, got an MBA there back in the 90s. And at the Daniels School, right? The Daniels School now. I was there before it was the Daniels School. Okay. And um, and so, uh, yeah, dialed into the internet for the first time while I was in business school, if you think about that. Wow. wow. And um, yeah. that really ages so, you, times you out. I, I know, <laughs> I know. But I did I did my, uh, my final thesis project on Silver Oak and uh, built the business mm -hmm. model. And then that led us to uh, acquiring full ownership of the winery. And then I moved here full time about 20 years ago. So uh, I have been here now for... For many years, raised our kids here in Napa. Um, it's just a great, great experience. So, if you don't mind me asking, during that that business project for your your degree, you had to like learn from wine from scratch, or did you have some experience in the industry before that that could leverage for your business plan? Well, I had the good fortune of growing up in Colorado, so I didn't grow up here, you know, as sort of what we would call a cellar brat uh, in the business, and I mean that in the in the most wonderful way. Um, and so, you know, but I've always been very curious, uh, I actually spent my youth farming, uh, in Colorado. And so the farming part of the wine business is what attracted me. And, and so I, I was around it and knew it, but, um, you know, I am not the winemaker, thank God. And, um, and, and not a scientist really by background, I'm more of a, of a business person and, you know, think more of our, of our, I, I've got, I've gotten a lot of experience now. And so I definitely have my opinions about things, but, but, um, you know, I've been very fortunate to, to, uh, uh, have a wonderful team around me and, and be able to, um, you know, make these wines that people drink and buy every year and, and love. So you said you're not the winemaker. So we're going to tread on a little dangerous ground here. We're going to talk wine. Uh, most of our listeners have been through some kind of winery tour somewhere on the planet. But can you walk us through uh, the process of from putting a vine in the ground and the challenges associated with that to releasing a new vintage? There's a lot that goes on in between. Yeah. So the biggest factor that people don't understand, often don't understand in winemaking, especially fine winemaking, and it's really particular to Silver Oak because we have about the longest process that you can imagine. So, you know, from the time you plant a vine to uh, the time um, the grapes are ready to make into wine. It's about five years. It takes a vine five years before it produces, you know, bottle quality grapes. And for us, like we pick, uh, the, let's say the 2022 vintage, 
um, then we're, we're, you know, we ferment it, we put it in barrel for two years, and then we bottle it for two years. So, um, you know, day after tomorrow, we're going to be releasing our 2018 vintage. So if you're listening to this uh, in the future, uh, it's February of 2023. You know, we are releasing a wine that we made five years ago. And, um, wow. and so Sign me up. Know, that, that, <laughs> that part of it is a big, you know, is a big part of it. So it, it's, you know, it's, but it's pick the grapes, crush them, ferment, barrel, bottle, and then enjoy. And uh, in a nutshell. So clearly there's not only a huge capital investment, you know, if we talk about the, and we have to talk about the rest of the risk involved in making wine and mother nature's one of those pieces of risks that you have to deal with. I heard um, that you had a horrible fire in at Silver Oak in 2006. That was a, that's an unexpected twist of mother nature, but that was probably um, very challenging to deal with. It was a yes, and that, you know now I call it my personal fire because so many people <laughs> in our community have been affected by by fires. But I, I actually was at the gym working out in the morning, and my wife called me and said the winery is on fire. And I, I ran down here, and sometime when you when you visit Sandra, I'll show you the picture of me in my gym clothes. Um, but <laughs> you know we yes we had a we had a uh, terribly devastating fire here in two thousand and six. The actually tomorrow is the anniversary of the fire. It was on February second. Oh and, wow. Um, and so we, uh, the dumpster caught on fire. It was an accident. It happened to be a windy February morning, and it burned down the original building that we found at Silver Oak in, uh, which was an old dairy barn that was built in, we think, about 1920, and uh, destroyed 117 barrels of wine um, mm. and did enough damage to the winery that we decided um, to rebuild. And so one of the things that you have being a lifelong farmer and and uh, person of the land is a lot of resiliency. So mm -hmm. um, literally the afternoon of the fire, we went down and our CFO at the time, who's now retired, said she was crying and people were upset. And she said, what are we going to do? And really without missing a beat, I was like, we're going to rebuild the winery. And and we opened a bottle of wine and everybody started laughing. <laughs> and almost in that moment, you know, we, we bounced back and we started the plan. And now, um, you know, Sandy, you've been here. Uh, we built a beautiful new modern facility that with 35 years of experience and really it was the best thing that ever happened to us. It gave us a chance to refresh the brand, think about things in a different way and, and build a great winery. So none of the vines were damaged. It was just the buildings. Huh? No, it was just the building. Yes. Oh, that's fortunate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, I, you know, I really admire people who can take a, you know, a negative and, and turn it into a positive, you know, and, and you all have really done that. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous facility. Uh, and I know that when we were kind of snorkeling around the valley, looking to see where we were going to do the, you know, the charity event that Guy and Tim did, that it was like, uh, this is the place. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the thinking that went into putting that, cause it's a whole new facility, uh, that has a, a really nice arrangement for events. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, back when we were designing this course, we were responding to the fire. So there was some time pressure on us. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, we built the winery. That was our that was our primary purpose here is to make and, you know, age and produce our wines. Um, but as part of that, especially in the modern era, um, hospitality is a big, you know, big factor. So to have uh, the new tasting room, uh, we built a commercial kitchen. And then we really thought about guests coming and enjoying wine and being able to do events like we did for Tim and Guy's foundation here, um, as well as more, you know, smaller, more intimate events. We've done dinner for four at the winery too. Mm. Um, and the event that Sandy and I are referring to was dinner for 400. <laughs> so it was, it was, uh, it can go <laughs> completely, it can go both ways. And so we, we did really think a lot about how to, um, uh, have the flexibility and the space and the, you know, we're in a beautiful place cause it's Napa Valley. Uh, and so I appreciate your, your, you know, enjoyment and, and, uh, and it, there was a lot of thought that went into it. Getting back to mother nature, the fire of course is something that's not really expected, but dealing with water or whether you have too much or you not, don't have enough, especially with some of the challenges that California's had over the years, how do you deal with those risks as a, as a farmer? You know, it's it's very, very interesting from an industry standpoint, what's been happening with uh, the application of science and technology to wine growing. I'll just stick to that. Um, we think today that we use about 30% of the water that we did 10 or 15 years ago. 
Um, wow. So in the old days, you know, we would go kick on a valve at seven o'clock at night and come out at seven o'clock in the morning and turn it off. So, you know, you might do a 12 hour set kind of when the vines looked like they needed a drink during the summer when it's hot. And, um, you know, today we measure uh, with neutron probes. We use leaf water potential. Um, we do, uh, you know, just in the old days, like if you wanted to fly, take an infrared picture, an NDVI of a vineyard to see where vineyard health is, you would need to fly an airplane to do that. Today, you can do it with a drone and you could literally do it every day. You know, it used to cost $6,000 to get, uh, you know, a vineyard block done. Um, so all of that application, I think, has really helped us manage water use. And we also know that um, deficit, what we call deficit irrigation, is produces better wines. And so keeping the vine just with enough water instead of like satiated all the time produces better wines. And so we're using a lot less water. Um, you know, we've also taken, and some of this has to do with our whole sustainability approach, but we've also taken our experience in the vineyards and applied it to the winery because we use, you know, a great deal of water in the wineries. Um, and we actually built another, another winery in the Alexander Valley, which we finished in 2017 and took what we learned here in Oakville from the fire experience, uh, and applied, um, that building is actually designated as a living building. And so like our water use statistic, just to answer that question, the wine industry uses about six to seven gallons of water per, per gallon of wine. That's kind of the rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. We know for a fact that our Alexander Valley uh, facility uses one gallon of potable water per gallon of wine. Um, and, you know, so we, we beat it by, you know, a factor of, of seven, right? And so it, it, it was, wow. it was an amazing application of, good thinking and, and, uh, and taking some risk and, and, uh, you yeah. know, figuring out how to, how to make sure it works. And now, you know, this is going to be our seventh vintage in the, in the winery. That's, I can't believe that that much time's already passed and, and it works great and it makes wonderful, wonderful wines, uh, which people enjoy. So you're well down the, well down the road on the E part of ESG, I guess. Oh, and been committed to that for a long time. Yeah. Usually it's, it's not enough water around Napa Valley this year. Uh, I'm sure you were affected by the the rains. Was that a problem having too much water in your in your vineyard uh, vineyards this year? You know, it's funny because I've had a lot of friends reach out and say, "Are you okay?" Uh, texts and emails and calls, and and I keep telling everybody it's been wonderful. You know, so no having you know the the reservoirs full, um, having uh, the water table you know get regenerated. Uh, it's been wonderful. And and people forget that like in the winter of 16, 17 and the winter of 19 and 20, we had 60 inches of rain in Napa. Normal here is about 33 um, inches of rain. And so, we're, you know, for, for Napa Valley, we're not even to, you know, normal levels yet. Um, it was very, very rainy for a month. Um, and of course, the snowpack up in the Sierra is tremendous. And so, you know, it, it it's just a, a swing of Mother Nature always, you know, we're always fighting what mother nature's thrown at us and, and adjusting to it. So, but to answer your question, it's really not too much water. Um, you know, I know there were communities affected and people died and I, I'm not trying to belittle that at all, but from a farming standpoint, you know, we welcome rain, uh, all the time. Are you seeing any, um, uh, detectable sort of long range, uh, long-term impacts of climate change, or is it just all over the place and you can't see anything discernible? My canned answer is that if we can't grow Cabernet Sauvignon in Napa Valley, that the Earth's problems are going to be much more complicated than that. <laughs> there you go. I can you relate know, to that. I love it. Because yeah. Manhattan will be 12 feet underwater and, yeah. you know, nobody will be out there to buy wine. But I think, you know, there, I mean, of course, there are uh, people in the industry that are trying to plant different varietals and think about you know, those things. And, and, uh, you know, I sp have spent time working, uh, in the oil and gas business and I know quite a bit about geology and time. Uh, we've already talked about that a little bit as a huge risk for us, but I think on the global scale of time, um, a hundred years is not a big deal, you know, and there, there is, I'm not belittling climate change at all. I think man has definitely affected, you know, and, and done less than good things to the earth. Um, but it is very complicated and there are events that could happen. Um, you know, volca a, a volcano comes out, we have a two or three degree uh, Celsius cooling event. Um, you know, we might be having the opposite problem of, of global warming. 
And, um, and so there's a, there's a lot of different, you know, thinking about that. And I just don't think we know. So I, my, uh, personal response is just keep my head down, keep doing what we do, enjoy every day and enjoy every moment. Yeah. And like you said earlier, when the bad thing happens, you know, suck it up and move on. We've made impact to try and impact, you know, impact our carbon footprint at the winery and everything that we do. So, we, you know, we're doing our part as well. So back to the nature issue, pests, how do you deal with pests and, and how they engage? Yeah. They like grapes too, huh? Yeah. So that's a great question. We don't, it's, it's interesting. We don't have a lot of issues, you know, we don't get it when, when we had, when we had the fire in 2006, we had had a flood a month before. So we had a flood on January 1st, the fire on February 2nd. So on March 3rd, I was joking that we were going to have the locust come in and take off the vines, <laughs> but we don't really have that. So the thing that we do today is we promote um, beneficial predators. And so ah. we, we've done, you know, if you came out in the Napa 15 or 20 years ago, there were, there were no weeds and no grass under any vine in any vineyard anywhere. It was a bit like the dust bowl in the thirties because we, everybody used ground up and we were, you know, crushing the vine, crushing the weeds, trying to, pr you know, protect them from competing for water, uh, with the vines. And we've learned that that's not okay. So now we are really into soil health, uh, promoting, uh, you know, what we call beneficial pests in the vineyard to, you know, to go get the ones that are not good. And so, um, we do, and we don't spray any pesticides. We don't, you know, we're not we're not out there kind of, uh, you know, trying to wipe out every living thing in the vineyard. And and um, it's a you know it's a little bit like using bird netting. I remember an old vendor one time. I was like, you know, why don't you use bird netting? And he said, because birds don't eat that much, you know, <laughs> so the, on the grapes. So so the pests. We do have some issues with pests from time to time, but not. It's not a. It's not a you know a wide ranging thing. There are threats like, uh, there's, uh, you know, two critters that are both in the sharpshooter family. Um, they could cr create huge problems. And so the industry's on that and, you know, we're doing a lot of things to try and prevent, you know, some sort of, uh, dramatic change in, in, um, in, uh, you know, in, in different bugs that could cause problems. So, so digging deeply into the mother nature piece, uh, earthquakes, I imagine an earthquake probably doesn't bother a vineyard too much, but, uh, but it probably, it could bother your, uh, your, your facility there. I mean, do you think much about that? Or is this like, okay, we're in Northern California. We have earthquakes all the time. No big deal. In 2000, uh, when we built this winery, um, I remember having a discussion with the engineer and, uh, being from Colorado, I was uh, very, very aware of earthquakes and kind of nervous about them. So I told, I kept asking the engineers and the architects that we were working with, you know, I was like, what about earthquakes? What are we going to do about wine storage? You know, how is this going to work? Finally, the engineer got tired of me asking questions and he said, David, let me put it this way to you. If there's an earthquake, you want to run into this building. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, and you've been here, Sandy, you know, we built a portable you know, st oh, yeah. uh, stone building. And so, and so in 2014, we had a 6.0. A uh, very big test of that, and um, right. and I was the earthquake happened at three twenty. I was in the winery at about four fifteen in the morning after I cleaned up my house a little bit, and people always are like, "Did that earthquake wake you up?" Everybody says, "Yes, the earthquake woke you up." And um, you know, we this winery did really well, and so you know, I think I I think earthquakes and rain might be in the same category that that uh, there's not a lot you can do about it, and and we don't love them around here. It's that's they're not a lot of fun. So I imagine it's kind of scary to live through an earthquake. I haven't, I haven't been in one, that, been a hurricane, but not an earthquake. That was, that was the biggest one I yeah. had been in. And it, it was pretty yeah. scary because you don't know how long it's going to go. And 6.0 is pretty yeah. big. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So moving off of the mother nature piece, um, you know, Sandy and I have had to deal with throughout our careers is the risk of human error. And so I suppose you have to have certain procedures or, training to keep employees from making mistakes or contaminating or ruining a batch? What sort of things do you have to watch out for there? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I don't get asked that frequently. I really like that. Um, it's a big deal. So we have a lot of protocols, you know, a lot of checks. We have things that happen from time to time. Um, you know, years ago, uh, when, when we even used to use Roundup, and I'm talking 25 years ago, we had an employee spray Roundup over a vineyard and killed the whole vineyard. 
um, Ooh, you know, as an accident. Mm. And so he, he didn't stay with us. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But, that's one uh, of those big mistakes that, you know, yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, we have, um, uh, you know, during the fermentation process, there's, we add yeast and, you know, there, those need to be done in, in particular, uh, quantities. And there's a lot of math and, you know, figuring out what's going to go into the tank. Um, and so just, you know, all of those different kinds of things, I think, um, uh, around the winemaking side of things. Um, and then, you know, the interesting thing about human error is we also want to promote ingenuity and trial and thinking about our different ways to do things and taking some risk, frankly. And so one of the things that we benefit by is we're not, you know, we're not a big winery. We, we make, you know, about 150,000 cases a year. So, you know, the big giant wineries make millions and millions of cases a year, but we're big enough that we can do uh, trials and try things in meaningful experimental ways. So like, you know, we'll do 10 tons, uh, you know, three different ways. And, and then we can taste those wines as opposed to, you know, in, in a research environment, you might do 20 pounds. And, um, and that, that's not a commercial, you know, quantity of grapes. Um, and so we do, you know, on the one hand, we want to be careful. And on the other hand, we want to, we want to test and try and, and uh, experiment with different things. But at the end of it all, David, you end up with these beautiful Cabernets. Uh, uh, is there anything that we left off <laughs> that is a risk you deal with on a daily basis to make those things? Well, let's talk for a second about the, the wine consumer and our listeners uh, as customers that what are, you know, what are their risks? So a bad bottle of wine corked, you know, how it's, how it's preserved, uh, how you feel the day you're drinking the wine. Um, you know, so I think that, um, I, I just wanted to share that, you know, from, from that side of the, of the bottle, if you will, or the glass, um, enjoy what you like and don't let people, don't let wine snobbery get in your way. Cause it's, uh, it can, it can happen. And, uh, you know, that silver oak, we promote, uh, uh, you know, enjoyment, conviviality, creating a moment, uh, you know, we own the trademark on life as a Cabernet and, um, and so. I think we want to, you know, we, we, it's, you know, it's interesting because I think um, listening to the adrenaline zone, I think the people that are in these crazy different um, uh, areas of their lives, they take it very, very, very seriously, but they're also so good at what they do that, that, um, that they, uh, they have a casualness about them. I mean, I think that's been a thread that I've found through um, listening to your program and, and, and I've found that to be fascinating. Um, and so I, th I think that's, I think that's, a, a, a you know, something to explore as you guys go forward with this. Yeah. You know, the common things of risk takers are, 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 we've found a number of this, this is our 32nd episode and, and, you know, you're right in there with them. Uh, I can tell you that by the way, I have from the consumer side, I have two rules about drinking wine. One is life is too short for a crappy bottle of wine. So if you open it and it's not good, pour it out. I totally agree. Uh, which by the way, has never happened with a bottle of silver oak. And the other is I will not um, open an expensive bottle of wine with somebody that I don't think appreciates it. And I have friends who appreciate it. It's not snobbery. It's friends who know what it is and friends who don't. And I want to preserve those moments for people who actually get it. Those are great. Those so, are great rules. I fully, I yeah, fully support yeah. them. Well, you know, David, to reiterate on something Sandy said, it seems like from what you've done, you're one of those people between cowboying, skiing to, I guess, uh, Sandy told me you had some time as a stage musician, as a stage musician. So you have a little bit of an attraction to adrenaline and risk taking in general as well. Yeah, I think, I think growing up a skier, uh, you know, it got, it got uh, instilled in me and the music thing is, is really fun. We actually, uh, I have band practice tonight. Uh, with the boys and we have a, a band called the Silverado Pickups and uh, uh, Sandy I don't know if you saw us perform or you were backstage I did. but but we uh, you've warmed up you for know, you've warmed up Tim we've McGraw, warmed three up for times. Tim McGraw right? three times yeah and, very nice and I, I, I used to I joked that the first time we warmed up for Tim McGraw was the you know was was the 20 minutes of my life that I lost because I, I barely remember it at all I was so nervous and you know I'm not a natural performer um, but I love being in the band and, and we have a great time and, and uh, but it is uh, very adrenaline producing to, uh, to be up on stage and, and uh, it's harder to play in front of four people than it is in front of 400, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, cause you might actually personal. hear back from the four. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, but it, but it's great. And some fun. of your bandmates, uh, your teammates there are are competitors, right? They're they're uh, people who also make wine. You know, I like to think of it like like uh, like you know the like Paris in the in the twenties, right? Or it's like more like we're all artists that are hanging out together. So we don't, you know, we it's very it's a Napa Valley is a wonderful place, and and people really get along, and people share so many ideas, and so you know there we do have uh, other vintners in the band, and and we're all. You know, we all have a great time and we enjoy enjoy some wine together and play music and and um, it makes for makes for a very good time. Well, risk comes in many forms, and getting up in in front of a huge crowd of people as a musician is certainly one of them. So we did record an album, and uh, it is ah. we're just about to get it out. Um, it's called uh, Bacon, Butter, and Salt. The album, the Silverado Pickups. So I might do a little plug for my album and. Uh, hopefully, by the time <laughs> y'all are listening to this, you can uh, you can Google that up and and uh, and listen to it on your favorite streaming service. But every good chef puts on almost every meal. <laughs> yes, at least the the butter. There's is... a story behind that, but we'll have to save that for another time. So <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so you know, and on the personal side of handling the risk, you know, we, one of the things that Sandra, I think, would she would agree, we've discovered is that there's kind of this duality of of how people. Uh, have an intense focus on it, and they they are able to calculate the risk extremely, extremely well. The people who are really good at what they do, but they're also there's also this sort of almost callous, relaxed, like hey, as long as I don't die, if this thing doesn't work out, there's something else I can do in my life. So so they've got this sort of ju juxtaposition of intense focus on the risk, but at the same time detaching from it. Is that does that resonate with you? Do you do you, do you have a sense uh, the same way? Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to express a minute ago with with you know so many of your of your episodes. I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, you know, I think at this point, you know, I guess you get to a point in any you know business, industry, life, pursuit, sport, hobby of kind of you've seen it all. And you know, I think I'm not a trained pilot like like you both are, but I have been around a lot of that and. You know, I think that's why you go through every single scenario you can imagine so that when it when it actually happens to you, you've already done it. And so, you know, from a from a wine standpoint, we've you know, we grow wine every year. We it's either too much rain or too much or not enough rain that those are that's only common. There's never a perfect amount of rain. And yeah. and, you know, whether you have a pest problem or a personnel problem or, you know, or something goes wrong or you pick too early or, you know, whatever. You just got to roll with the punches, and I think I think um, people who deal with risk on a on a on a basis all the time, they just their their uh, ability to roll with the punches and not let it take you down, um, mm -hmm. you know, gets refined and gets and gets they get to be experts at that. Um, whether you're a bull rider or a, or a mountain skier yeah. or a yeah. mountain climber, yeah. or, it's building yeah. resilience. Yeah. So you're not only a uh, successful winemaker and a musician, and I see your guitar in the corner behind you. Uh, but one of the great things, David, I like about you is that you uh, you believe in philanthropy and you do a lot of philanthropic work, and not just the concert we talked about earlier, but, um, you know, and it's not uncommon for some of our risk takers to be uh, uh, philanthropic. And can you, there's so much that you do in the Valley. I, I can't even begin to list it, but, you know, tell us, tell our listeners about that. What do you do and why do you do it? Oh boy. Well, I, I, I have been involved in a lot of things. I think, you know, part of it is that I do have a platform to do good and people love, you know, um, whether it's a wine bottle in a silent auction for a kid's, you know, a kid's school or a book club or something all the way to, you know, having, um, last year I actioned off an event with Kelsey Ballerini as, as a private concert who, you know, Kelsey's a, is, is, is a, you know, just a, uh, she's not rising. She's a star now. Um, and, and she was incredible. And, you know, we did an amazing event and we raised almost a half a million dollars, uh, wow. you know, for a charity or the thing that we did for, you know, for Tim and Guy. So I think just having the ability to, to give back and, and participate in that, um, is, you know, it's very gratifying. I, I don't do it from an ego standpoint. We're not, you know, you don't see my name all over that stuff at all, but it, it's, uh, um, you know, we live in a place where people like to come and they'll be very generous. Uh, we are hosting this year for our local community. Uh, we're bringing back a live auction, which hasn't happened since COVID uh, in the Napa Valley, uh, used to be known as Auction Napa Valley. And uh, we're actually going to host the main event and the, and the live auction at Silver Oak uh, June 3rd this year. 
So very exciting. And if you want to support uh, all the things that make great wine, you know, please, uh, please support that. And uh, you can find out about it at collectivenapavalley.com. So, or maybe .org. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate to be able to do that. And, and um, you know, we, we support hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different charities around the country uh, every year, you know, often with just a bottle of wine or a tour and tasting, um, but very fortunate to get to do that. I do want to ask you, how do you feel about the 2018 vintage? You probably had a sneak peek at that a couple of times. Yes. Oh, absolutely. As, as a matter of fact, we just tasted the, uh, the 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. So I, I have a, that's, that's how I get a sneak peek because we always taste the back vintages when we do the blends, which we just completed the 22 blends. Um, 18 is beautiful. You know, it was, it was a, in, in hindsight, uh, we knew it was a good vintage at the time, but it was a, kind of a large vintage. And now we sort of know that like large quantity vintages tend to be very high quality, which seems a little bit counterintuitive, but, but it's, but it's not. Uh, so we're just thrilled with the wine. Um, the other exciting thing talking about taking a risk is that after almost 20 years, we changed the Napa Valley package from a silkscreen label, uh, to a paper label. And so, um, that's something that, uh, our customers other, well, now their emails are out, but. Most people have not seen this brand new label that we designed like three years ago. And, um, and so, and part of that was for a sustainability purpose. So both what's in the bottle and what's on the bottle is very important to us. And, and, uh, I think people are really, really going to enjoy it. Um, so yeah, eight, 18 Napa is the next one coming out. If you still have a moment, I'd want to go backwards a minute to the, um, the science and the technology use in the vineyard. I was a little fascinated with that. So you do you have little experimental areas of the vineyard that you try out new technologies before you deploy them in a larger sense yeah so i mean back to that scale thing like you know you could you can do stuff with bunches of grapes or you can do stuff with tons of grapes and so if we're doing a control experiment like this last year we did an experiment with leafing so when you go through the vineyard you you want the canopy the leaves on the on the grapevine to provide sort of dappled light to the fruit while it's ripening so this is over weeks, you know, weeks periods. It's not, it's not. And so we go through and we'll do an experiment where we'll, we'll, we'll pick off a specific number of leaves, like let's say six leaves on each shoot on each vine. So you're talking about a lot of leaves, you know, through, uh, an area. And then we'll do another, another area where we'll leave the canopy as, as it was to see how that activity affects ripening and then affects flavor development. Um, and so. Um, we, we have vineyard blocks that we like to do that in, but you don't want to use every block every year because then, you know, you'll create different things and, and you know, there's carbohydrate uptake in the roots. I mean, we can go down a deep route. Huh. Um, and so typically if we're doing an experiment like that, we'll do like four rows and then we'll do four rows of experiment, four rows of control, four rows of experiment, four rows of control. And then you have to flag all those because then you have to pick them. You have mm -hmm. to make sure they get into the fermenter correctly. You have to pick the right amount yep. of tons, you know, so, but, but we do, you know, we do a lot of experimentation like that. Then you make the wine and then, you know, we'll taste those over several years to see how that experiment, um, you know, sees um, from a sensory standpoint, if we can assess what the experiment did. Um, and we, of course we do a lot of chemistry and, and uh, we're also, you know, um, um, trying to, to uh, control that environment in the moment, um, you know, so there's a lot of data around that. And, uh, but those are the kinds of experiments that, you know, we could do in the vineyard. So do you guys share all the vineyards, share their experiments or is some of that proprietary to get to your particular vintage of wine? That's a great question. So there are industry, you know, groups and the many, many vintners will talk about what they're doing. So I'd say the default is to share. Um, there are certain vendors who don't like to share. We're, we're on the hundred percent share. Let's learn. Let's, you know, I think Robert Mondavi was the champion in Napa Valley of, of, uh, you know, the rising tide floats all boats. And so, mm -hmm. um, yep. he, you know, that, I think that is very true. And so I think there's not enough, uh, proprietary data about something I would do in the vineyard that, that I wouldn't share with you as to here, I tried this, it didn't work, you know, or it did work, or you should try this or. So there's a lot of talk like that, that, that uh, we all share um, collectively as, you know, yeah. farmers here in the Valley. 
the little peek into that science uh, and behind the art of winemaking is fascinating. Not a lot of people, I think, understand that there's a strong base of experimentation and technology there. There's so much that goes into a bottle of wine. Well, D David, uh, let's talk for just a second business risk in the sense of, you know, uh, I'm on the board of Molson Coors. So, you know, the Bev Alk industry is, you know, sort of segmented into you know, spirits, wine and uh, beer and, you know, other other crazy things that are coming along the line. How do you see that evolving? Is the wine business on an up, up uh, cycle or a uh, flat down cycle? How do you see that playing out? I think um, there's a couple of factors to that. One is that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the, what younger people are drinking and, and, but from a, for, for fine wine, which is what I do, um, you know, which is a category, um, uh, I think that the future is very, very bright. I, I believe that, you know, people have been drinking great wine for, for years and years and years. People are not drinking our wine to get a buzz or for this, you know, so the, right. I, I do tailgate with it. I've got two kids at Notre Dame and so I do tailgate <laughs> with it. But, but in general, you know, it, it's, 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 um, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's happened post COVID with restaurants, uh, you know, I was joking during COVID that you'd go out to dinner and it would be half the food for twice the price. And so, you know, now, you know, you're paying $70 for a steak at places. And so people are willing to spend 200 or $300 on a bottle of wine, you know, if you're paying $70 for a steak. Um, so I think that's been very, very interesting uh, how that's changed. You know, I also believe you, you actually mentioned it earlier in the broadcast that, that, um, you know, you won't drink a bottle of wine um, unless, you know, you're going to enjoy it with the person that you're enjoying it with. And, and the life's too short to drink cheap wine. I think people really understand that. I was, I actually was in uh, New York and had a glass of wine on the plane on the way back. And it was terrible. You know, it was, yeah. <laughs> it was hard to drink. It's hard. So, yeah. and so you don't, don't do it. You don't want to do that. So I, I think, I think for, you know, everybody, I mean, from clothing to food to, you know, people that um, enjoy fine things and that's important to them are going to continue to drink excellent wines and, and we're going to continue to make them. So I don't see it as a, as a giant risk. So at your end of the business, it's uh, it's in good shape. Yeah. Yeah. And I think from a generational standpoint, you know, we have Silver Oak in particular has become a family tradition. So it's not like I don't drink wine. You know, I would rather have, you know, a $40 tequila than drink wine. It's like, oh no, we, we have wine on Thanksgiving because this is our family tradition that I grew up with. And that's been really gratifying to see. So I have to ask if you're tailgating with fine wine, what is the food that is accompanying? We did a big tailgater for the Clemson game last year. And, and so we had uh, beans and ribs and, and, and there were like six <laughs> bottles of silver oak sitting on a table. And, and there, you know, we had, we had hundreds, like more than a hundred people at this tailgater. And I, I said to the parents, I'm like, why don't you guys open those bottles? You know, I brought them. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to. They're too fancy. We're not going to. We're not going to have that. And I said, I brought the bottles of wine. I went and opened all six of them. They were gone in 10 minutes. <laughs> so I believe you. Once, I believe once you. they were gone, they were gone in 10 minutes. So, so uh, hey, but good wine will go good on cornflakes, too. right? Yeah. And I, especially the Alexander <laughs> Valley. I like to say the Alexander <laughs> yeah. Valley will pay, pair with anything. Yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Those all are right. wonderful. Well, David, this is, as Sandra said, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I can't wait to get back out there and connect with you. Uh, so much to talk about, so much to do, and, and maybe a, a, a couple of glasses of wine to go along with it. But we hope you'll keep taking risk uh, in that business because it, it sure uh, is a lot of fun to spend time with you and with, with your wines. Well, I'm very passionate about what I do, and I, I invite you all to come and, and visit anytime. It's a beautiful spot, and uh, I'm looking out at Napa Valley right now out my window and it is a great spot. I've got a few bottles. I'll get maybe a, a bottle to to uh, Sandy so she can enjoy it. Uh, Sounds great. Uh, so she can. Yeah, really it was really fascinating chat, and I really enjoyed poking on the science and technology piece. Being well, the geek that I am. Yeah, well, come up oh, and a we lot can. Going on there. I, I can introduce you to our viticultural geeks, and and you'll you'll okay. have a blast. So yeah, come come visit. Awesome. <laughs> so, I sounds, will do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Well, Good thanks. talking to you. Thank All you. Right, I appreciate okay. it. That was David Duncan, who runs the Silver Oak Winery in Napa Valley. I'm Sandra Magnus. And I'm Sandy Winnefeld. Check us out on social media, including a short video of our interview with David on TikTok. Our handle is very simple, at The Adrenaline Zone. <laughs>